Matthew chapter 26. All right, so today on the Christian calendar is traditionally referred to as Palm Sunday. This was the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, just prior to his crucifixion. And as he came into Jerusalem, he was celebrated by people who lined the streets waving palm branches. That's why it's called Palm Sunday. And they were hailing him as the long-awaited Messiah. Unfortunately, by the end of the week, most of those same people were calling for his crucifixion. People can be very fickle. One minute they love you, the next minute they they hate you. It's like American politics, right? One minute they love a candidate, the next minute they don't. It reminds me of something that Winston Churchill, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, once said when he was asked how it feels to be so popular among people. He was asked, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? To which Sir Winston replied, it's quite flattering, but whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. (laughs) People are fickle. They can love you one minute and hate you the next. This is what happened to Jesus. On Palm Sunday, people were cheering him, but by Thursday of that same week, they were jeering him. Even among his closest friends, His most trusted bros, the guys that he spent a solid three years with, even among them, one betrayed him and one denied even knowing him the final week of his life. At a time when he needed them the most, they bailed. Now, the one who betrayed him was Judas, and the one who denied him was Peter. The story of Judas ends in condemnation. It doesn't go well for him. The story about Peter, however, ends in restoration. Judas was remorseful, but he turned away from Jesus and hanged himself. Peter was repentant, and he turned toward Jesus, and Jesus later restored him. Both had failed him, but only one really recovered. There's a big difference between these two friends who bail on Jesus at the last week of his life And it's an important lesson for us to learn because, you see, we have all failed Jesus. I mean, strictly speaking, because all have sinned, the Bible teaches us, we've all therefore failed Jesus. The question is, which path are we on? Are we on the path of condemnation like Judas, or are we on the path of restoration like Peter? It really is our choice. And in case you don't know which path you are on, by default, the Bible teaches us that we're on the path of condemnation. Because we have sinned against God, because we have all failed God, we are by default on a path of condemnation. But God has provided a way for us to be restored, to be forgiven. And we can choose that path of restoration like Peter did. To stay on the path of condemnation is just certain death. I mean, we have the opportunity to get off that path. If we just like, I don't really know what path I'm on, I don't really care what path I'm on, you're going to die. It's like if you're in a building that's on fire and the building is burning and the alarms are going off, it's the invitation to get out of the building and save yourself. But if you just sit there and go, I I hear the alarm going off, I see the strobe lights, I really don't care, you're going to die. I mean, that's just the way it works. I remember years ago when our kids were little, I will start reading from Matthew 26 in a minute, but (laughs) this is all a free introduction. When our kids were little, we went up to Hershey Park, took them up to Hershey Park. We stayed a night at a hotel at Hershey, and in the middle of the night, like two or three o'clock in the morning, the the fire alarm goes off, strobe lights, the whole deal. And I'm one of these people that just like, oh, you know, I mean, at first I thought, well, they're they're probably just testing the alarm system. Well, probably not at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. So some numbskull has pulled the fire alarm. It's probably fine, right? And so, you know, the kids are, you know, and the, the strobe lights and all this stuff, they're awake and, you know, Terry's awake. And I'm like, that, everybody, it's calm. Just calm down. I open up our hotel door, look down each end of the hallway, and other people were doing the same thing. I could see their heads popping out through their doors. They're looking. They're trying to smell for smoke. We all look like prairie dogs poking up from the dirt and just kind of all looking around like, what's going on? What's going on? I didn't smell smoke, didn't seem like a big deal. Let's just go to bed. The alarm will probably go off in a couple minutes. False alarm. And Terry, the smarter of the two of us, says, I think we should call the front desk. (laughs) 
All right, fine, I'm gonna go back to bed. She calls the front desk. I hear her go, mm-hmm, okay, okay, all right, thank you, bye. The laundry room is on fire, we need to get out of the building. <laughs> okay, that's a game changer. Now, now I'm motivated to get off this path. Like, I've got some real motivation here. I'm gonna die if I sit here and ignore this. This is the way it is for us. So we're gonna identify with one of these two guys. I hope we identify with Peter more than we do Judas. Uh, because the fact of the matter is that the good news related to both of these guys who failed Jesus is that in the case of Peter, the good news is that when we repent, as, as he did, and when we turn to Jesus as he did, then we will encounter what I'm entitling today's teaching, the God of second chances. He is the God of second chances. He is the God of multiple chances. And so we're going to read from Matthew 26 here in a moment, but let's first pray. Lord, as we come before you today, as we open up our Bibles, we just thank you that you are a good and gracious God and that you are forgiving and you are the one who restores us when, whenever we sin against you or fail you. And we thank you for the story of Peter in contrast to the story of Judas, that we can learn what it means to fail you and nevertheless to be restored by you. So help us to understand as we read this story today, we love you in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. Matthew 26, starting at verse 14. This is first the part about Judas. Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him, that's Jesus, to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to, here's your word, betray him. Now, on the first day of the Feast of, of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the, the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve, and now as they were eating, he said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will, what? Betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born." And then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, you have said it. Like, yeah, you, you in fact are that guy. So this is the Jewish feast of Passover on the calendar at this place that we're reading right here, which coincidentally on this year's calendar, Passover started last night. And Jesus is reclining with his disciples, having this Passover meal with a Seder, which is typical of the celebration of Passover. And there he is, and he's reclining at the table. He's, he's having this meal with his disciples. Leonardo da Vinci is there painting the picture of the whole thing. <laughs> Not really, but anyway. And during the dinner, Jesus predicts and identifies the one who will betray him, Judas. Now, Judas has already made a deal with the devil, so to speak. The Bible tells us that even before this conversation, Judas had already gone out and he had made a deal with the religious leaders who didn't like Jesus that he would betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He gets paid. He's already got the money in his pocket by the time this conversation happens. And so he's already the betrayer. John's gospel tells us when John records the same story, John says that at the moment that Jesus exposed Judas for being the betrayer, John tells us that Satan entered him. So Satan possesses Judas at that point. And John's gospel also tells us that at that moment when he is exposed and Satan enters him that he leaves the dinner. He leaves the room. He's no longer part of this Passover meal. The story continues, but it's without Judas now at this point. Jump to verse 31, because now Jesus is going to expose Peter. You know, both of these guys, Judas and Peter, are, are about to, in the process of failing Jesus, and he, and he calls them out. And so verse 31 says, Then Jesus said to them, meaning his disciples at this dinner, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. 
Now, the word stumble there, in some translations, some Bibles translate it, all of you will fall away. NIV says, fall away on account of me. It is the Greek word in the original language, skandalizo. We get our English word, scandalize. When, when you're scandalized, you're offended, you're, you're shocked. And so, that's the word that is being used here. They're offended, and, and, and he predicts, you're going to be shocked, you're going to be offended. Now, it is not the Greek word apostasia, an apostasy, a falling away from the faith. He's not saying you're going to fall away from the faith. He's saying you're going to fall away out of sight from me. Because Jesus is about to get very unpopular as, as, as he's about ready to be crucified here. And so, you know, you don't typically want to hang around somebody who's going to be crucified because you might get caught up in the whole process too. And so these guys, Jesus is calling them out in advance. You guys, you're all going to stumble. You're going to, you're going to fall away. I'm telling you right now, you're going to abandon me. And he keeps saying in the rest of verse 31, for it is written, and now he quotes Old Testament scripture, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He says, but after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble or fall away because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even, he steps it up. Peter steps it up. He can't keep his mouth shut. He's like, it's bad enough, Pete. What are you doing? But he steps it up. He goes, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Notice this. Every single one of the disciples thought more of themselves than they should. But it was only Peter among them who singled himself out there in verse 33, and he says, even if, this is, this is a loose translation, this, you might read this in the Message Bible, even if all these losers fall away, I will never, that's the word there, circle it in your Bibles, I will never fall away, I will never stumble. Never, never, didn't your mama tell you never to say never? It's dangerous when we use the word never. These extreme words like never, always, don't talk like that. We're, we're all guilty of doing it, but we shouldn't because we get ourselves in trouble when we use these exclusive words, never, 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 you never, you never this, you never that. As some, some guy says, you know what? My wife, she never stops talking, never. Talk, 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 that's all she ever does. She never stops talking. Well, yes, she does. When she sleeps, then you can talk. <laughs> The ladies are like, you know what the problem with men is? The problem with men is they never say they're sorry. Never. They never say they're sorry. They never say they're sorry. Yes, we do. Just only as a very last resort. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being real with you. Guys want to say they're sorry, but they have to feel it. And most of the times we don't feel sorry. It's like, why do you want us to say we're sorry? We're not really feeling it. You ladies, on the other hand, you say you're sorry for just about everything. Every, and it's not even your fault. You're just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's a rainy day. I'm sorry. <laughs> the stock market is down. I'm sorry. There's a dead deer on the side of the road. I'm so sorry. Even as I'm preparing my notes for this Bible study with this illustration, my wife comes to me last night. She says, would you like a, 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 a clementine? Clement Clementines are like oranges that never grew up. I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I'd love a clementine. Thank you. Brings me a clementine. I eat it. And afterwards she goes, was it good? Did you like it? I said, you know, actually it was a little tough. I didn't, I, it wasn't very good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, thank you very much. I'm writing it down right now in my sermon. You're making my point. It's not your fault. You didn't grow the clementine. Why are you sorry about it? Don't be sorry. We just don't care as much, ladies. I just want you to know. But don't say never. Peter says never here, and he sets himself up for failure. Jesus corrects him, and he says to Peter, listen, before the rooster crows, before sunrise, you will deny me three times. And so Jesus exposes the heart of Judas, a betrayer. He exposes the heart of Peter, a denier. And then the supper concludes. They go to the Mount of Olives where they find lodging for the night in the Garden of Gethsemane, where here comes Judas with a band of Roman soldiers. Still looking in your Bibles there at Matthew 26, look at verse 47. 
And while he, Jesus, was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Friend. Notice that. Still calling him a friend. Why have you come? When Luke records this story in his gospel in Luke twenty two forty eight, 48, he adds another question that Jesus asks Judas. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? You know, the only thing worse than being betrayed is to be betrayed with a kiss. There's nothing worse than being betrayed under the pretense of love. Now, Judas will feel badly, the Bible tells us. After he does what he does, he will feel badly. He will. Uh, I'm I'm gonna read, if if you wanna glance ahead, you can, but from chapter 27 of Matthew, verses three, four, and five. This is the swan song, if you will, for Judas. Matthew 27, verse 3, then Judas, his betrayer, was remorseful, the word is used there, remorseful in verse 3, and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. He knew it. And then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. It's very tragic. He was remorseful but he makes no effort to get right with God. He was remorseful, but not repentant. And so he took his betrayal with him to the grave. All right, Peter on the other hand. Peter joined remorse, as we're gonna see here in a moment, with repentance and thus he could experience restoration. See, look, we all know people who are remorseful, they're they're sorry about something, but they don't really wanna do anything about it. Maybe they're sorry that they got caught. Maybe they're sorry that it hurt you. Maybe they're sorry about how this affects things, but they're not really sorry enough to do anything about it. So remorse with that repentance is just emotion. Remorse with repentance before God allows us a place of restoration. And this is what Peter models for us. And so here's his story. After Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's hauled before the Jewish ruling council known as the Sanhedrin in the Bible. They hold a mock trial for Jesus and they violate their own Jewish law in holding this trial the way that they did. Now, when they hear what they hear from Jesus, they determine, because they didn't like him anyway, they didn't believe he was Messiah anyway, they determine he's guilty of blasphemy because Jesus claimed to be God. They, hearing that, determined this is blasphemy because they didn't believe that he is God, and thus the Jewish law required that someone who was guilty of blasphemy be stoned to death. The problem is that about 30 years before this, the Roman Empire had taken away capital punishment from the Jewish people, they were not allowed to exercise capital punishment according to their own Jewish laws because they were under the domination of the Roman Empire. And so the Jewish leaders had to appeal to Pontius Pilate, the governor of this province, to get a Roman legal um, accusation against Jesus so that he could be crucified under Roman law since they as Jews didn't have the right to kill him themselves any longer under their Jewish law. And so for them, for the Jews, it was blasphemy. What did they trump up for the Roman charges? They, they trump up sedition because he's claiming to be God. See, the Jews are saying, we don't think he's God, so that's blasphemy. And, and if he's saying that he's God, well, he's elevating himself above Caesar. And that's sedition. And that's what Pontius Pilate went with eventually, reluctantly, but he did. So Jesus is facing these false accusations, this trial, And it tells us here further in Matthew 26, if you still have your Bibles there in Matthew 26, look at verse 67. And then they spat in his face. Now these are the Jewish leaders. They spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, mockingly, prophesy to us Christ, who is the one who struck you? Now, Peter 
sat outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he, here's our word, denied it. He denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, hey, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Okay, pause for a moment. He, he was from Galilee. The, the, the Jewish people from the region of the Galilee had a different accent. They had a little bit of a twang. And so, um, he, was, he was being noticed for his Galilean accent. And that's why this person says, hey, your speech betrays you. You know, we can hear an accent there. You, you must know this guy because you're from that same area. Verse 74, and then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so he went out and wept bitterly. Now, you know, you look at how this whole thing unravels and, and you stop and you go, wow, I mean, the apostle Peter here, he's, he's throwing down some curse words. And I guarantee you, it wasn't dang it or fudge, right? He's cursing. And verse 72 says that he denied with an oath. You know how we say it today? We say, I swear to God. I swear to God that isn't true. That's what he was doing. I swear to God, I don't even know this guy. He was disassociating himself with Jesus because it wasn't popular to be Jesus' friend in this moment. You know, Jesus is, is being accused, tried, about to be crucified. I don't want to hang around that. This is the way Peter was. I remember... When I was a freshman in high school, before I, could, before I was old enough to drive, if I ever missed the bus, my mom had to take me to school. Well, it's high school. And I don't want my mom driving me to school. So I would always say to her when we got like two blocks away from school, hey, mom, just drop me off here. Just drop me off here. Well, she eventually, you know, got the clue. But the first time she's like, why? Why do I have to drop you off here? I'm going to take you to the door. No, that's all right. Just drop me off here. Why? I'm just going to take you to the front door of the school. Drop me off here, mom. It's good exercise. It wasn't good exercise. I just didn't want my friends seeing mommy drive me to the front door of high school. I was too cool for school. Fact of the matter is some of us are too cool for Jesus. We only want to associate with him when it's to our benefit, when we think that he's an asset versus a liability. And so if it's fashionable or if it's cool, sure. You know, let me identify with Jesus. You know, how many times have we seen, it's almost so fashionable and cool, it's almost like this hipster thing, like somebody wins a Grammy, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to give this to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Really? I didn't even know you are a Christian. But all of a sudden now, you're dropping Jesus' name because you think he's an asset. You know, you got the limelight, you win a Super Bowl, you're going to thank Jesus. Um, you hit a home run, you're going to thank Jesus. You know, the people, baseball runners run into the, you know. What do atheists do, by the way? I don't know, when they hit a baseball home run, and just, I don't know. <laughs> All kinds of people want to just all, yeah, thank Jesus, thank Jesus, thank Jesus, when it's really cool, when it's really popular. But what if it's not? You want to date that other person, but they think Christians are weird? Deny Jesus. You go for that job interview, but you hear your boss doesn't like Christians? Deny Jesus. You want to be cool on the athletic field, but your teammates think Christians are weird? Deny Jesus. You want to fit in with your coworkers, but they think Christians are weird? Deny Jesus. See, it all depends. This is the way we work, sadly. If Jesus is to our benefit, we'll drop his name. If it's not, we'll deny his name. But news bulletin, when Jesus was being nailed to a cross, he had no problem being associated with you and me. He had no problem being associated with you and me when he was nailed to a cross, and there was no benefit in it for him. Like, we didn't add a cool factor to Jesus. It's not like God was up in heaven saying, you know what? I really need some of these people on my team. They're going to really improve heaven, faux show. So, <laughs> go after them. No, we're not bringing anything to the game. This was all because God pursued us with his love and then demonstrated it on a cross when we were completely liabilities for God. <laughs> Notice in this passage... In verse 75, it says, so he, that's Peter, went out and wept bitterly. 
The Greek language of the New Testament Greek, uh, says that to weep bitterly is a klausen pikros. It means to sob violently. I want you to picture a grown man just crumbled up in a fetal position on the street somewhere there near the courtyard area, just sobbing violently, just weeping uncontrollably. This guy felt such complete humiliation and shame over denying Jesus, over his failure, over his sin, that he was sobbing out of his brokenness. But aren't you glad that Jesus restores broken people? There's almost an entire chapter in the Bible, John 21, devoted exclusively to Jesus restoring Peter. You know how it is that you can sometimes be feeling the weight and the guilt of your sin and your failure against God, and, and you can intellectually know that He forgives you, but you still carry around like this, this weight, this sense of shame, this sense of you know, does God really love me? And you begin to question God. You begin to question yourself and a relationship to God. And it's easy, to, it's easy to get stuck there. Even though you might have asked the Lord to forgive you and you, again, intellectually know it. But, you know, somebody once said the greatest distance in a human's life is the 18 inches between your head and your heart. It's like, how do I get into my heart this sense of real forgiveness? of knowing that I've been restored and that God loves me, it's sometimes hard. And in John chapter 21, there's almost an entire chapter devoted to this whole process of Jesus helping Peter to understand that he can be restored, he can, be, he can come home, he can be brought back. Again, this isn't, this isn't a commentary on falling from the faith, but he's fallen out of fellowship. He's, he's still grief-stricken. And so in John chapter 21, Jesus offers the same number of times for Peter to affirm his love for Jesus as Peter denied knowing Jesus. Three times. In, in John chapter 21, three times, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. I'm going to ask you again, do you love me? You know, you know that I love you. I'm going to ask you again, do you know that you love me? Yes, I love you. Now, you know what's interesting in the original Greek language? There are different words for love in the Greek language. We have just one, and it's, it's sad because it's very limited in English because we can talk about I, I love my wife, and you could say I love ice cream, and it's kind of different loves, right? But in the Greek language, there are four different words for love. The highest supreme love is agape, agapeo, to love supremely. Then there is a brotherly kind of love, that's phileo, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Storge is family love. Eros is erotic love. So the Greeks have a better way of communicating what love is. When Jesus asks Peter the first time, do you love me? Jesus used the word agapeo. Do you have the highest, most supreme love for me, Peter? And Peter replies, it's interesting, in the original language he says, you know that I phileo you. Peter was being honest. He's like, he probably was thinking to himself, if I said that I had the highest, most supreme love for you, I probably wouldn't have denied you. So I'm going to come in right under that and say, I phileo you. I love you like a brother. Second time Jesus asked him the question, Jesus again uses the word agapeo. Peter, I'm going to ask you again, do you agapeo? Do you love me? And the second time Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And again, Peter said, phileo. But the third time that Jesus asked the question, he got down on Peter's level and he said, Peter, do you at least phileo me? And Peter said, you know that I do phileo you. And then Jesus said, follow me. I love the way that Jesus always comes down, he condescends to our level to bring us up. He doesn't say, here I am, now make every effort to get to where I am. When God took on flesh, he condescended to our level to come down to where we are, to rescue us, to restore us. 
When I take different groups to Israel, one of the places we stop is a little village on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee called Tabga. And Tabga is the place where it is believed that Jesus restored Peter. And so I have a Bible study there with our group out of John chapter 21. This is the place of restoration. See, some of you need to hear this because, again, we're all guilty of failing Jesus, but some of you in particular need to know that he is the God of second chances, that he loves you, that he forgives you, that he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And we can either choose to take a path of condemnation by default and turn from God, or we can seek restoration and turn to the Lord and allow him to forgive us and to love us. Church history tells us, not the Bible, this is just church history tells us, that even long after Peter had been restored with Jesus, By the way, remember the first person that God used to preach the first evangelical message of the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2 was Peter. But even after Peter had been restored, church history tells us that wherever Peter would go in declaring the gospel, the good news of Jesus, there was always one heckler in the crowd that you could hear go, To remind him of his failure. How human it is of people to remind us of our failure, but how divine it is of God to remind us of his forgiveness. People will sometimes be very unforgiving, and they will want to remind you of what Jesus has already forgiven you of. All right, there's always somebody cackling like a rooster in the crowd. So be it. The voice you really need to hear is the one who says that of Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions and remembers your sins no more, says the Lord. And Jeremiah would write in Lamentations 5, 21, turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the God of restoration, that we may fail you, we will fail you, but you stand with open arms to receive us. Help us to weep bitterly over our sins, that we may receive completely your forgiveness and your love. I pray right now for those who are hearing this Bible study or watching online or who will later hear it by podcast, for those who are especially stuck in a place where they're wondering, God, can you really forgive me? Do you really love me? I'm haunted by some of the things that I've done. For them to hear from you that you were the one who blots out our transgressions for your own name's sake and you remember our sins no more. Turn us back to you, Lord, that you might restore us. Thank you that you are a God of grace, a God of second chances, a God of multiple chances, that if we humble ourselves and come before you in our brokenness, You restore broken people. And we thank you for that, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.